Thank you for that very warm introduction. And it's my pleasure to be with you this morning on Mother's Day as well. Um, so thank you, for, thank you for coming. And uh, particularly if you're not normally a, a churchgoer, thank you for taking time out to, to come and explore this, this question of I choose scientific evidence over belief. Where's the evidence for God? And I thought I'd start by sharing a bit about my uh, background. I, I was raised in a really uh, loving home, but one which was kind of religiously neutral. Um, you know, I didn't really go to Sunday school growing up. Uh, I didn't believe in God. And uh, I knew I was a scientist from early on. I always did my maths homework first and got really stressed about history and English and all of those things. And um, I ended up uh, doing all science A-levels and really loved it. And I knew I was a scientist. Um, I had a biology teacher that, during my A-levels, when I was about 17, handed me a copy of Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, and said, you know, go and have a read of this and, and see what you think. And as I read this book, which told me that I basically was a, a, a carrier of my genetic, of genetic material, and the purpose of my life was to transmit this material to the next generation, and that is essentially what human beings are. Um, and as a 17-year-old, I, I read this and kind of absorbed it, actually. Didn't really think about it terribly much. And then went on to um, university to study biochemistry um, in Bristol. And, and when I started, I, I had this same question, really, that, you know, I assumed that science and God were, were not compatible. And in the first week, uh, I went to this event called Gorilla Christian, which has nothing to do with barbecuing, but is um, where you have a, a, a panel of, of, of Christians, and you can ask any question you like. And during this session, I put my hand up and said, surely you can't be a scientist and believe in God at the same time. And I was given the answer that science and uh, belief in God or religion are operating on different levels, different planes, answering different questions. And uh, this was literally rocket science for me. I'd never heard anything like that before, and it, it started me seriously thinking about these questions and these issues. And, um, and so after this degree, I went on to spend time in pharmaceutical industry and then to do this PhD in brain imaging and spent uh, several years doing postdoctoral research before moving into this area of apologetics, addressing the, the questions that people have about God. And I had made two assumptions. Uh, the first assumption that I had made was that God and science are not compatible with one another. That's exactly what lies at the heart of this question we're looking at today. That you either put your faith in God or science. That's what we're saying when we say, I have to choose scientific evidence or belief. It's either or in people's heads, but not both. We have to choose. We're made to feel like we have to choose. And we see that science is familiar, and it's rational, and you can demonstrate it, and it's evidence-based. But belief in God seems to be irrational, undemonstrable, it's unscientific, and there's no evidence. And therefore, I choose science. It's a no-brainer. This is an example of faulty logic a faulty dilemma where you are made to choose between these two options as if they're the only options available, when in reality there are other choices that you can make. I'll say more about that in a minute. The second assumption I had made was that science has pushed God out of the picture. Religion belongs to the dark ages. Science belongs to the modern, educated world. Yes, prior to science, we of course invoked God as the explanation when there was no other explanation. But now that we have science and we have mechanisms, God is no longer needed. He is pushed out. This is often referred to as God of the gaps. Well, let's look at this question, this first assumption that I had made, that God and science are incompatible. It's worth asking the question, historically, what has been the relationship between science and belief in God? Did you know that belief in God had a significant impact on the rise of modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries? 
At that time, there was an explosion of discovery, and many of those scientists believed in God, and science was a means of studying the world that God had made. They said, look, if Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands, then surely studying those heavens will help us appreciate God's glory even more. And some of these scientists include Johannes Kepler for his work on planetary motion, who described himself as thinking God's thoughts after him. Or we have Galileo for his astronomy work, Newton, laws of gravity, um, Louis Pasteur, pasteurization, Gregor Mendel for genetics. People who made significant contributions to the forward movement of science. And they believed in God. And their belief in God was the driving force behind their science. They they realized that there was order in nature because there was an orderer behind it. And this does not just belong in the historical realm. Today, there are many scientists who believe in God. And their their belief is the driving force for their science. People like Charles Townes, who discovered the laser and received a Nobel Prize for it. Or Francis Collins, who headed up the Human Genome Project and now heads up the main U.S. funding body, the National Institutes on Health, uh, the main research body in the USA. And therefore, it can't simply be a choice between either God or science. Science. Because there are scientists on both sides. Atheists who say science has dispensed with God. And theists who say science confirms and drives forward their faith in God. You see, the real battleground is between different views of the world. Your worldview or lens through which you view the world and make sense of it. And the two main competing worldviews in this science God conversation are atheism, which to summarize is that matter is primary. Matter was first and mind and everything else is derived from matter. Versus theism, which says mind first. In the beginning, God, the mind of God is primary And matter and everything else is derived from that mind. Well, which of these belief systems makes best sense of how we actually do science? How do we move forwards and decide which one is the best? Well, let's look at how we actually do science and which one helps us make most sense of the practicalities of science. You see, science assumes two types of ordering that are so obvious we don't even think about it. Firstly, there's an order in nature. There's an ordering in nature. If you set up a, an experiment at you know, a school or a university here in High Wycombe and then you, you go and repeat it um, you know, down the road in central London and you keep all the parameters the same, what should you find? The same results. It's so fundamental. We we don't even think about it. But there are laws that are stable, that make scientific studies repeatable. And without this order, we couldn't do science. Where does that come from? Secondly, there's an order in the human mind. As as human beings, we have a curiosity about the world that starts young. We ask questions. We want to investigate and make sense of things that we don't understand. We're able to think logically and rationally about the world. Well, where does this come from? You see, atheism would say that both of these have arisen from blind, accidental processes. But on that basis, why would you necessarily expect to find stability in nature? And why would you expect to think logically and rationally? Some scientists, including Stephen Hawking, would say that the human brain is nothing more than a a collection of randomly firing cells. 
But the problem is, how would we have the capacity to recognize that our brain is purely random firing cells if random firing is all that they do? If the human mind has been formed through a blind process resulting in a throwing together of molecules and atoms ad lib, why should we trust anything that our minds tell us? Scientific things, religious things, or anything You see, this view doesn't just undermine science, but the whole basis of rationality. John Lennox, a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford, says this, The very existence of the capacity for rational thought is surely a pointer, not downwards to chance and necessity, but upwards to an intelligent source of that capacity. Richard Swinburne, professor of philosophy at the University of Oxford and one of the foremost philosophers today and also a Christian, wrote a book in 1996 called There is a God. And in that book, he says this, Note that I am not postulating a God of the gaps, a God merely to explain the things that science has not yet explained. I am postulating a God to explain why science explains. I do not deny that science explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains. You see, many assume, maybe you're here today with this idea that God is anti-intellectual or that God hates science and that when you have to step into a science lab, you have to take off God. Or that belief in God has no place in the life of a scientist. But I'd like to persuade you, you can make a case that God is the very being who makes science possible. Because the order in nature and in the human mind can both be traced to the same source. A rational, intelligent being known as God. What about this other assumption that I had that that, that science has pushed God out of the picture. We don't need God anymore because we've got science now, this God of the gaps idea. Well, here, people think they have to choose between two mutually exclusive alternatives, either a scientific mechanism or God did it. And this is another example of a faulty dilemma. It's a bit like saying... Imagine you've just landed on Earth and you are introduced to Microsoft Office for whatever reason. You're presented with Microsoft Office and you knew nothing else about it and you're told you must choose between these two reasons as to why this exists. Either because programming languages have been invented or because Bill Gates exists. And you have to choose. It's either or. And we don't have to look at this for long before we realize they're both valid explanations. One is describing the underlying mechanisms and the other, the being who got it into into motion and upholds it. You know, there is no logical conflict between science uncovering mechanisms and the existence of God who created and sustains this world. And this this idea, we can apply to so many of the different debates that are going around at the moment. There's so much conversation about, do I need to dispense with evolutionary theory to believe in God? Again, here you've got, it's either evolution or God. This is another faulty dilemma. There are a range of different positions you can hold uh, with regard to the evolutionary processes. But in terms of a mechanism that creates diversity within species, there's no logical conflict. That's helping us understand some of the mechanisms of within species diversity. You don't have to dispense with that. It's, it doesn't do away with God. He's still the one that set it in motion and upholds it. Same with Big Bang Theory and God. Actually, the Big Bang Theory is a recent scientific discovery that actually agrees with what the Bible has been saying for millennia. The first words of Genesis chapter 1 say, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
the Big Bang Theory says that, that the universe is expanding, which means that it can be traced to a singularity, which means it had a beginning. And this idea was resisted in the scientific realm for a long, long time because of the extent to which it agrees with the Judeo-Christian view of the universe. Big Bang Theory tells you the mechanism. God is the being who set it in motion. It's not either or. And you could say the same with the Higgs boson, the God particle. There's a verse in the Bible that says, in him, in God, in Jesus Christ, all things hold together. There you have it. In the Bible, the Higgs boson, the particle that holds it all together, that can explain large atoms and molecules, and t- uh, large planets and bodies, and tiny atoms and molecules, all in the same verse. You do not have to choose the mechanism or the creator. Do not be forced into that dilemma. It's worth asking when we look at this, and we, you know, all of our eggs are in the science and evidence basket. Can science answer every question that we have, that you have, that I have? Some people say yes. Science proves things. You can only trust what you can prove, what you can demonstrate in a laboratory. But I say to you, what about all the things in life that we have confidence in that we cannot prove scientifically? For example, here we are on Mother's Day. I know that my children love me. Can I prove it? And moreover, can I prove it in a laboratory? No but I have confidence in it. And there are so many other areas of life like that. And there are lots of other areas that add meaning and value that are not scientific. History, politics, economics, poetry, literature. You see, I would say no. Science cannot answer every question that we have. Science cannot answer some of the fundamental questions of a child. Why are we here? What is the purpose of my life? Science can describe the chemicals that whiz around your brain when you're in love. But it cannot tell you why love exists. And it can't tell you who to date and why. And it can't tell you how to behave when you're in that uh, relationship. It can't speak to our ethical behavior. Science can describe beautifully the mechanisms behind sadness and grief, depression. But it cannot offer you comfort in suffering. It cannot get rid of your guilt or bitterness. It cannot help you forgive the unforgivable. Science can't fix our behavior. It can describe and account for human behavior in terms of evolutionary instincts and brain mechanisms and behavioral traits and patterns. But it can't fix us when we say, I saw that going differently. I would have liked to have done that differently, actually. Science can't help us be the person that we want to be. And it can't help us to stop making mistakes. The Christian faith would say this is not just genes and instincts playing out. The Christian faith says there's something absolutely beautiful about human beings. But there's also something wrong with the world. And it's diagnosed as there's something wrong because we are living without the God who made us. The apologist Ravi Zacharias describes this loaded word sin in this way. He says it's a violation of purpose. That there's something wrong with the world because we are not doing fundamentally the thing for which we were made, which was to walk in life with the God who made us. That we're not just in a system of cause and effect. We are, you are, an eternal being with an eternal future. 
made by an eternal God. And that we can't fix ourselves. We need help from outside to live right. And to do that, we need someone from outside who understands our predicament but is not part of it. Somebody who is absolutely beautiful, but is not part of the brokenness. And that person is uniquely and absolutely uniquely fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, who entered human history from eternity, took our mistakes and wrong upon himself, and died and rose again, so that we go free. We have hope You see, science cannot give us answers about life beyond the grave. Much as we would like it to with cryogenics and cloning and such uh, similar things. But the Christian faith says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, will not perish but have eternal life. And that that eternal life starts in this life. It's not a ticket to some playground after we die. It begins now. And the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can be at work in us, helps us break patterns of behavior that we cannot break ourselves. Let's look at this idea that miracles are anti-scientific. This idea that, okay, that, that, that seems attractive, but now you're talking about miracles. And this is a problem for me. The idea of God interfering with nature seems irrational. It's like he's meddling. Well, did you know that miracles actually require science to be identified? You see, C.S. Lewis says this. It's a, a, let's say that uh, you get up in the morning and in your, uh, I don't know, in your bedside table, you put, uh, you've got 30 pounds and you know it's there and you head out for the day. And you come back, and when you come back, there's only 10 pounds left. What should you conclude? And everyone else is out, so you're wondering, how did this happen? Do you conclude that the laws of mathematics have been broken? Or do you conclude that the laws of England have been broken? It is precisely because the laws of mathematics remain unchanged that we are able to recognize Someone else must have come in from outside and done something. Miracles are not violations of the natural order. You need to understand the regularities and the orderliness of nature in order to recognize extraordinary things that happen. It is because people do not normally get up from their graves and walk again that we can uniquely identify the resurrection of Jesus. is absolutely unique. There is nothing else like it in all of history. And yet, if one person has uniquely risen from the dead and says that if we follow him, the same will happen to us, then this is not just a case of true for you, but not for me. This is either true for all of us or none of us. And it changes everything. And it changed everything for me in my early 20s. If God exists and has brought everything into this world, the things that we can see and the things that we can't, then he would be capable of establishing laws and regularities and also occasionally suspending those to do something extraordinary. Not because he likes meddling, but because he loves people and extraordinary things are needed to rescue us. And put us back on our feet. Well, okay, you might say. But how on earth do I take a step of faith? You know, science is evidence-based. But faith is blind. Don't ask me to throw away evidence and take a blind leap into the dark. 
We often think that, they often talk about science and faith. And that faith represents a retreat from the evidence. Well, do you know, we exercise faith all the time. And it's always on the basis of evidence. A scientist exercises faith every time they step into the lab, every time they design a new experiment, every time they write a grant application, they are exercising faith that the orderliness of nature will continue to be so. And that the orderliness of their mind will continue to be so. So let's not just put faith into the domain of religion. Scientists exercise faith all the time. It's just a case of what you put your faith in. We exercise faith in daily life on the basis of evidence. I really enjoy running. And um, about a year and a half ago, I was running in the dark. And um, to my horror, I did a, a face plant and landed. I, I tripped and landed on my face on the ground. It was dark. No one uh, could see me. Anyway, I got up and uh, ran home dripping blood and entered in, ended up in the local hospital. And I was chatting to this doctor that was about to sew up um, my chin, just kind of making polite conversation and asking him how long he'd been in his position, hoping that he'd say, years and years, I've got loads of experience. And he, he said, oh, I'm just coming to the end of this six-month rotation. <laughs> so I realized I was talking to a junior doctor and he was about to put my face back together. What happened to my level of faith in him? (laughs) It plummeted. But why? On the basis of the evidence of his experience, his qualifications. Later on, a more senior doctor came in, a registrar, and started to help him with some of the stitches. What happened to my level of faith? It went up. Why? On the basis of the evidence, here was a doctor with greater experience, more qualifications, seen more patients in his life, and was more likely to do a good job. We do not even need to step into the realm of religion to talk about faith on the basis of evidence. We do it all the time in daily life. And it is the same in the Christian faith. Jesus Christ does not ask you to take a blind leap of faith into the dark but to consider putting your faith in a person for whom there is very good evidence. And people did that all the time in the New Testament. There's a story of a woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. The doctors could do nothing for her. She was emotionally spent, financially spent, physically spent. And she sees Jesus walking along in this crowd. And she reaches out to touch his cloak, thinking, if I can just touch his cloak... Uh, I will be healed. And Jesus feels something go out from him, even though he's in a crowd and people are crushing around him. And he turns around and said, who touched me? Somebody touched me. And eventually this woman, who would have loved to have remained anonymous, comes forward and says, it was me. Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith, has healed you. What kind of faith? Do you think she'd never seen him before? Just decided, okay, I'm going to give this guy a go. He's just arrived in town. Or do you think she saw him operating around Galilee, the way he treated people with dignity, addressed individuals, doesn't give one-size-fits-all answers. Every person matters. You matter. This woman put her faith in Jesus on the basis of the evidence. He does not ask us today to take a leap into the dark, but says, will you examine the evidence and go where the evidence leads? There's his evidence for his, from history, the manuscripts that put together the Bible. If you want to discount The Bible is a historical document. You have to discount every other historical document, including things like Caesar's Gallic War, Homer's Iliad. Overwhelming evidence. Encourage you to take a look. There's the natural evidence that inspired those early scientists. 
that you can see traces of God in the incredible beauty in the natural world as well. And also the evidence that comes from that sense of longing for identity and meaning and purpose. If God doesn't exist, there's no ultimate meaning. There's no ultimate purpose for your life. You can create some subjective meaning and purpose if you like, but there is no ultimate And yet, if God exists, you are an absolutely precious and unique person who is eternal in nature, who is made and handcrafted by God. Now, which of those matches up? Which is a more persuasive evidence for you in terms of the longing of of our heart as well as the objective data in the world out there? For me, about halfway through this biochemistry degree, I was 21 years old. I didn't have every question exhaustively answered. I did grill a few more Christians along the way. But I just had enough to persuade me that the person of Jesus Christ was real. And he loved me. And he was utterly unique and trustworthy. And I decided to follow him. And it was incredible to return to science, uncovering mechanisms, but also knowing the God behind them. Being in relationship with the one who set it in being. As we think about and close, as we think about this question, I choose scientific evidence over belief. You know, that the, the word for Jesus used in some of the New Testament is the logos, the word. And it's that Greek word from which we get the word logic, the logos, logic. And you could say that choosing to be in a relationship with him, the logos, is the deepest expression of what it means to be rational. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And if you come to know me, I will set you free. Do you know him? I want to urge you today, don't settle for halfway. Don't settle for second best. There is life in all its fullness with the creator of the universe. And if, there are any, if, there, if you're here and you're considering this question and it's a barrier to faith for you, I want to encourage you to consider the evidence. Consider unique events and go where that leads. And my experience is it leads to a person. And if you actually feel like you are at the point where you would like to enter a relationship with the person of of Jesus Christ, then I'd love you to just uh, just, uh, pray pray with me now. Just a very simple prayer, prayer of sorry, thank you, please. And if that is you, please come and uh, talk to um, the leadership uh, or myself at the end as well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this beautiful world. Sorry that I've been living without you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Please come into my life and make me new. Amen.